Okay, Dynamite Delight. You see the title, and I know someone's going to say, what do you mean by very extra question mark? Well, watch the video. I'm going to say, watch the video. And they say, I watched the video. Can you explain? No, watch it again. Because that's what I'm going to do. You see, whoever is seeing it, if you actually watch the video, I will explain the best way possible. You look at this show, and I'm saying it now. You look at the show, you go, yes, they finally did what they need to do, and they did extra for it. Good. Then they did that and they did extra for it. Why? And then they did it and they did extra for it. Really? That's what it means. One, they did a good job. Two, they, it's a questionable job. Another one is why? why? Why did you do that? That's wrong. There you go. Go in the forbidden door. You hope that they're going to build more interest, particularly at MJF is going to be working next week, not this week, but next week with Roosh, of all people. They want to make sure they put the most important player in their game against one of the most roughest people at the moment, which he'll get destroyed, but you get my point, in a Roosh. But let's open with Mercedes Monet coming out. And I won't tell you that Los Angeles wasn't at least a little bit loud, but they weren't really great either. But it, it was done pretty well. And I'm going to say this about Mercedes. I got to say this because a lot of people are still pissed off that she didn't wrestle for five months. Why are you getting angry? And I saw just Alex getting, why was she not wrestling for five months? Well, dude, what would we get five months ago that we would get any different now? Honestly, right now, at this point, it's not about her being on TV. It's about them writing for her on TV. Because if the writing was bad then, you're going to see the same thing now. And I did see, and everybody said, dude, did you see, the, the, did you at least read the interview? Yes, I did. And I understand how she felt, particularly after almost not being able to wrestle ever again because how badly shattered her ankle was. How she landed so badly. And she said AEW saved a life, which essentially it did, but then it didn't because WWE would have taken her. But then knowing how Vince was and how crazy things were over there and still is because we're not even near the one year anniversary of TKO Group Holdings, who owns TKO WWE, TKO AUFC and Endeavor. That's the deal. And we don't know how much more we're going to get by the next this, this September. But, let me give it to you like this. You don't need to be pissed. There's no point in being pissed. If she wasn't going to be written very good then, before what? Before Jen Peppermint came in, would she be better now? She'll be treated no better than Ruby Soho, Soraya, and pretty much Athena, Tyre Valkyrie. You want me to keep going on? Do you want her there so badly five months ago? And she would be written for worse than them because everyone kept saying, and I heard Slug Daddy say it. I heard just Alec, no, not Slug Daddy, but just Alex said it. Solomon said it. JD said it. She would change the game. Now do you hear how they're talking now? They're wondering if she's going to be written for correctly. I said this before it even happened. That you should wait and see how the writing is going to be more than worry about if she's going to be seen. Because the women's division is still a mess. But here's where I said very extra why. Because at this point there's only one person on the roster. One that Mercedes Monet needs to deal with. And I'm hoping they will build into it. Because... At this point, you could say, well, because of the five months, and that's the reason why they did this match today. Sorry, allergies. That's the reason why they did this, because everyone found out about the five months. They just had to throw another match at her as quickly as possible with Sky Blue, saying it was her all on her. And we had the match later. It was fine, but I'm telling you right now, it doesn't really matter. There's only one match that really matters in this company, and that's Soraya... Going against Mercedes Monet. It has to happen. The automatic story of the last match Soraya had in WWE was with Sasha Banks. And pretty much, 
when when you really look at this situation with Paige and Sasha Banks, now Soraya and Mercedes Monet, it is an automatic story that must be told. And if they don't tell the story, or if they don't tell the story in time, it is going to be bad and it's going to be stale. And that's why I'm going like, why here? Because I'm wondering, why are they not showing Mercedes with Soraya? Why didn't Soraya come out instead of Sky Blue saying, I'm the one who attacked you, bitch. I'm getting your title. And then we got the match where she lost. There you go. Opening match, which I'm like, did you have to open with our boy? Did you have to open with him? Really? Really? You couldn't even wait until next week to give us Swerve Strickland. You couldn't. Why? Why couldn't you have Swerve on the same show as MJF? MJF could be in the beginning and Swerve could be the end and you can have them meet in the middle. Why? Swerve again opens the show with Kill Switch. Kill Switch. I understand it makes sense with the patriarchy. He had to face Kill Switch. He beat Kill Switch. Cut off his hair to get back when Kill Switch ripped his own hair out. That's fine. But why was it the beginning of the show? Why would you put Swerve Strickland, who's your champion, in the beginning of the show? That makes it feel like you don't think of him as a damn champion. I don't care what anybody says. You do not put your champion in the beginning match. Even though we do have that gauntlet, which I'll talk about, he didn't deserve that. He has to close the show more than most of the time, almost all the time. Maybe once in a while you can put him as a big or the middle of the one hour main event, but this is the second time you haven't opened a damn show with Kill Switch. No. Garbage. Moving on. The Eliminator match for the New Japan Pro Wrestling. Well, let me give it to you like this. Do you care about Moxley as champion of New Japan Pro Wrestling? That's the question here. And here's the kicker for me personally. If you're partnered, with New Japan Pro Wrestling, you must show more of their content. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not telling you that you need to watch all of their content to know what's going on. But if your current, one of your current roster members has the damn title, it would be wise to ask New Japan, hey, we're showing him, can we have some snippets of more of the work he's doing in your company? It'll make it easier for people to understand what is going on here, who is new, and those who really don't watch your product, so maybe they'll be more willing to watch it. Since they have the mentality where, you just go look it up. It's stupid. It's stupid. If anybody says, well, you should go look it up. No, it's stupid. It's the job of the promotion to make you care about that person. It is not the job of the wrestling fan to have to go search around for whatever so they can understand the reason why a person's wearing a rival title. Your job is to tell us why they're holding that title and what does it mean for this company and the other one. It is not you going over there and most of the time the other company will not even say much about it counting if you can find a way of watching New Japan Pro Wrestling and find either a website or pay big money to be able to watch the American version of it and be able to get it. And counting if you even could see it on Access TV because they do show on Access. There you go. Of course, Rocky Laws. And it's still about Moxie's arm. But the question is, will we even see what's going to happen with the current New Japan match they're going to have between Moxie and the other person who's going to be seeing if they can get the title? I don't know who it is, but that's the problem. I should know who Moxie's up against. Not just his promo, but some video some video present, presentation. Because not everyone can speak Japanese. Not everyone is going to know who that person is. And if it's so important that one of your wrestlers has got the damn title, you should make it mean something. Moving on. Next match. Hmm. Which already spoke about Mercedes versus Sky Blue. It was fine. Mercedes looked alright. Sky Blue jobbed. But then we had Stephanie, um, what was her name? What was her name? Stephanie um, Bakleen or Bakin, 
Bal, what do you say? Um, Bashir. I think her name is Bashir. I could be wrong. The Stephanie Bashir, who has worked with New Japan Pro Wrestling. She has the current New Japan Pro Strong title. I do believe she has, what, Shimmer title? Or is it the CMML female, women's title? I don't know. She's got two titles. They presented her. It's good to see they have brought her in to at least be in front of the new TBS champion. That's going to be her opponent at Forbidden Door. Don't know if she's going to be going for the title, but it's going to be one champion versus one who has double titles, from what I understand. She only had one title. I believe it was a New Japan Pro Strong. Why didn't she show the other title? Is it because she doesn't have the right to show because the company is not directly affiliated with AEW? That might be it. But seeing Stephanie, it's good to see. They brought her in. There's still a month to go. Maybe they'll let her do a couple of matches on AEW TV, which is a, will be a good thing. Hmm. Let me give it to you like this. The stuff in the back. The stuff in the ring. You see the learning tree. I know people can't stand it. Because he's so fucking conceited. And that's what he's going for. How you doing? Hi. I got nailed in the head. It was really painful. But as your learning tree, you know I'm going to do what's needed. And then Brian Keith coming out. And now he's joined the learning tree. Which is a good thing. At least Brian Keith is being utilized. Someone said, this guy is liked. He has some charisma. Let's form with Chris. Or Chris himself said, hey, let me have Brian Keith on my team. Let me have him and let me get him over. Because he's got charisma. He's got a good look. He can wrestle in the ring. Let me try something. With him. Let's see if this can work with Bill. There you go. And seeing that Hook comes out, ready to break some skulls in. But then Samoa Joe shows up, faces him face to face. And tells him something, which we don't know. And then when the interview with Renee Paquette happened, we still don't fully know why Samoa Joe decided to basically be by Hook's side. I do believe I know because when they had their first match, it was obvious from Taz. He said, Taz used to say, that's Uncle, Uncle Joe. Because Taz used to manage a Samoa Joe in... TNA. He knows Joe. He worked with Joe for at least a couple of years before he left TNA, went to either WWE again for a little while, and then nothing until AEW. But he knows Joe. Joe's known to him. That's the reason why he probably listened to him and said, hey, come with me. We'll take care of this bitch. That could be it. Now, personally, I'm actually glad to see that Samoa Joe is working with Chris Jericho as well. Because I don't think they've ever worked together. Let's make this clear. Joe has been on independence for decades. But he's never directly interacted with Chris Jericho, at least from what has been seen. Now, it doesn't mean they haven't. It's just from what main fans from the United States have not seen because they've watched WWE or TNA Impact. They never saw it. So they only saw Samoa Joe in TNA and then Impact and then WWE and then he left and then he's gone to AEW. That's what we got. And I'm going to tell you this. Seeing this, I'm hoping it'll be something more substantial. Do I believe it will happen? Ooh. Sorry, my eyes are really itchy right now. Do I believe it will be important? Don't know, but we'll find out eventually. Let me... Tell you this with the Don Collis family, seeing that Trent attacked Orange, who tore up the, the contract that Don wanted to offer him, and now Chris Statlander and Hathaway want to join the Don Collis family as well. This was a long time coming. This is the one I say, yes, finally, good, and with extra. Everybody says, dude. They never did anything with Orange Cassidy and Trent for years. They have. But it was so damn subtle, no one was paying attention to it. For more than a year, they kept teasing on and off, on and off, on and off, 
Trent actually began to get frustrated and getting tired of the situation where he's not getting anywhere. They made it so damn subtle, no one paid real attention to it. JD, if he did pay attention, he said, oh, it's garbage, it's stupid. Or just Alex the same way. I've never heard Alex say anything about Trent beginning to show more signs of getting frustrated, but I have. I've said it more than a few times, if anybody remembers, and now they finally pulled the trigger on Trent Beretta, who now is going to be working with Don Collis and Chris Statland, who everyone knows needed to do a change because it was obvious if Hathaway was there, it would make sense to have her change. And I know JD and Alex, they already knew this was going to happen, but they took a long time to do it. And now that they finally pulled the... Well, I botch here because this is a very... This is very important. You must make Chris Statlander look dominant before Willow Nightingale comes back. And you must keep them as separate as much as possible before they finally have their match. And I do believe the match should not be at a forbidden door. It should be at All In. I know that's a long time to go, but honestly... To really culminate their feud, it needs to be on the biggest stage because they had them together for so long. If you don't do it right, it's just going to be a waste of time because in one month's time, they're going to rush it. That's the reason why I'm hoping with Chris Statlin and Willow, they don't. But I believe they will. Okay, the hmm, gauntlet match. Let me give it to you like this. Whoever pins or submit, they win. There's no, um, you get pinned and another one comes in. No. Everyone comes in bit at a time. Whoever gets the pin, whoever gets to submit, wins. We got, who do we get here? We had Pac and Jay White, Mystico, Will Ospreay, what, um, Wen Newell, who's the, I can't pronounce his name, Juan, um, Mino, Juan Min, what is it? Wen Newell, oh, I am so bad with Japanese or English. <laughs> But basically the one who was trained by Moxley in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Winnable. 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 I believe his name. Claudio Castagnoli. Then Leo Rush shows up. Orange shows up. And Heli. Hel now he's from CMLL along with Mystico. Um, Helitico. I believe that's his name. Now I remember when he went up against. Um, who did he go up against? Brian Danielson. He was a very good, interesting wrestler because he did so many different moves that we normally do not see in normal American or Japanese style submission. It was interesting to see that he was trying to do different submission holds, different types of holds to try and defeat people. Here he did the same thing. But here's the thing. Do I believe this was the wisest thing to do? To let Will Osprey be the one to go up against Swerp Strickland. No. I'm saying it right now. Everybody else is going to say, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm not. Because yes, in one form, it is wise to let Will get this moment to see how he's going to be responded at Forbidden Door. And this will also culminate in how he's going to be booked going into All In back in Wembley. But then I feel that this is way too soon. They've been rushing Will as quickly as possible. You still have him part of the Don Collis family. He never broke away from the Don Collis family. He feels like he needs to break away from them before he would even touch the main title. And we're not getting that. It's like, you're going to have to do well now. Now, now, now. And that's the mistake there. And I don't agree with it. That's the part of saying, this is wrong. As much as it's going to at least give a gauge what we're going to get by all in, this is wrong. He should not be doing this. It's wrong. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the segment when it came to uh, when we get the how can I say this? When it comes to the elite. Seeing that um, Okada gets a which type of Lamborghini he get? Michelago, I think. I'm not sure which one he got. Or um, Villador or Michelago. I'm not really a car guy. But whichever car he did, it was a nice looking car. But in the end, he overacted. But it's understandable since he's trying to learn how to be more of a character compared to what he does in New Japan. You're going to see people who are not used to doing character stuff 
be over dramatic or under dramatic until they start really learning how to do it. Look at Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan did only Kung Fu movies. And then he had to learn how to do American style movies. Like he did with Chris Tucker in Rush Hour, which I say, well, I don't think I ever said this. If anybody ever heard Elizabeth Pena, she was in Down and Out in Beverly Hills and Rush Hour 1, and I do believe she also did too. I knew her in real life. I knew her when I was a little kid. So, seeing that Rush Hour had someone that I knew from my childhood was kind of cool. Shame she's passed away. But Okada's going to have to learn, like Jackie Chan had to learn, with time he will, if he's really committed to it, will learn to do more American style storytelling than Japanese style storytelling. But it's going to count of how determined he is. And seeing that this story is now developing that Christopher Daniels has come back. And now he's the interim executive vice president. What, what are you talking about? Didn't we just have Tony Khan come back and now he comes back but then he's gone? This, this shows you how I've stated this over and over again. It's not stable. Tony Khan should have never came back with with Darby Allen and did what he did. He should have never showed up on TV. He should have never shown up in the in in double or nothing. Nothing. You could have done that with Christopher Daniels through Kenny Omega. Instead of it being or better yet, you if you had to do a vid pack, put a vid pack up of him saying that I'm leaving Christopher Daniels as the interim vice president. That would have been the best thing. But in the end, even though that was done so sloppily, we now see him, due to the fact that the, the Bucks wanted to give a Jack Perry, the escape goat, the T and T championship because they did literally say, and I did know this beforehand, and I wish, and I say this right now, guys, if it's going to be shown on TV and it has not been announced yet, don't tell me. Do not tell me. Please, I'm stating this now. If it's something outside of AEW, WWE, and TNA, that it's something that's important, fine. But if it's going to be shown on TV and they're spoiling it, don't spoil me. I don't want that. Please don't do that. Please don't. Because I was already told that Adam Copeland was injured and they're going to do a tournament. You didn't need to tell me that. You could have at least stated that Adam was injured and they're going to address it. That would have been better. Don't tell me what's going to happen. I don't want to know. Okay? When there's certain times I need to know, I will tell you guys. You can tell me what I don't know, but this one was not necessary. But seeing that happen, seeing that they're going to give the title to Jack Perry, seeing that a... And this is where it gets me. Why did the acclaim come out? He didn't call for the acclaim. It made no sense that Christopher Daniels, who is the interim vice president, basically didn't call the acclaimed out. He didn't even say, oh, you guys aren't going to get away with this when they're going to come to him. He said, don't, no, no, you better not because I know you're going to try this. So I got some friends here and then the acclaimed music could have came out. But that did not happen. It just, he, he took the title. They're going to talk to him. Talk to him. And then the acclaim comes out with daddy ass without being called out. It made no sense unless he did call them out and I didn't see it. I, I, I don't get it. But this is why I said so very extra with a question mark. Because now that we have all this, how is this going to work for Forbidden Door going into all in. And can they book for Mercedes Monet? Can they book for Trent? Can they book for Chris Statland, who didn't do that bad of a talk after halfway? What are they going to do with Willow? What are we going to get with Orange Cassidy now? He's totally by himself. What are we going to get with Will Ospreay? Was it the wisest thing to put him in this position so soon when really it's like you're going forward, forward, forward without really booking him correctly? Breaking up with Don Collis, Katesca, he could have had his feud with Katesca. There is no feud. It's just him 
with the title wrestling. Peace.